is considered education. I'm shaking. Eyes darting back and forth. I'm nervous. To my right, Canada's ambassador to the United Nations in New York. Across the table, the executive director of the United Nations Population Fund. And me, Canada's girl ambassador. I'm nervous, I'm shaking, and I can tell that everyone around me is excited. And then it dawns on me that they're excited to hear my thoughts. About six years ago, I found myself at the United Nations headquarters in New York City for International Day of the Girl, a day dedicated to celebrating the power and voices of girls worldwide and reflecting on the challenges faced by girls and women on account of their gender. I spent three days learning and speaking about the inclusion of girls' voices at the international policy table. I experienced beautiful moments of knowledge exchange where individuals and institutions came together to collaborate on how we can create a better world for women and girls. I left that place with the restored belief in the power of international education policy and an unwavering certainty that a master's degree in international education policy analysis from Stanford University was exactly what I needed to contribute to these discussions. And so I came back, I wrapped up my bachelor's degree, and I sent out one graduate school application. And it was going to Stanford University. But while I waited, I decided to visit my birth country of Zimbabwe. And on the flight over, I couldn't help but dream about everything that I thought I would accomplish in international education policy. Oh my goodness, who would I collaborate with? How would my education help me in these collaborations? But then I also thought, what would happen when I arrive in Zimbabwe? How was my neighbor Cynthia doing? What was it like to be a young girl living in rural Zimbabwe? I mean, it had been forever since I lived there. How about my cousins? Were they still in school? I arrived in Wulawayo to find that the Wulawayo that I had left was very different than the one that greeted me. You see, Wulawayo is Zimbabwe's second largest city with a population of over 1.2 million people. I had arrived to find that Cynthia had now settled down and some of my cousins had completed school. Much of them had begun different chapters. In fact, many of them had moved to neighboring countries in search of greener pastures. I was excited to speak about international education policy, but the people that I cared so much about were focused on their daily lives. Understandably so. They were focused on survival. In fact, one of my closest friends, Pri, we spent all our time together in Bulawayo, had considered starting a reselling business, which meant that she would be in and out of the country. And I thought to myself, okay, Zola, we could go with her, or we could go to Gogo in Cholocho. So I packed my bags up and set to Cholocho. Cholocho is about 100 kilometers away from Wulawayo, which may not seem like too much, 
But given the road conditions, it ends up being about three, three and a half hours by public transport. This is Cholocho. I was specifically going to a small village in Cholocho called Mbambanga Manza. Mbambanga Manza has a population of about 500 people, but it is home. It was there where I'd find my Gogo, my maternal grandmother, her homestead, and her family farm. Bambanga Manza doesn't have electricity or running water. Most stoves are either gas powered or wood powered and public access to water means fetching it from the closest borehole. This was new to me, but it was in Cholocho that I gained a community of young women and girls from different walks of life. You see, we would wake up every day at about 4 or 5 a.m. to work in the fields. When we'd come back, we'd then divide our responsibilities. Some of us would be responsible for staying in the homestead, sweeping it with a straw broom, starting the fire, and ensuring that there was breakfast and lunch for everyone else. Others would be responsible for walking about two to three kilometers to the closest borehole to come back with 20 liters of water on our heads. Admittedly, personally, I preferred to stay in the homestead, cook, sweep, and clean, because I never truly mastered the beautiful art of balancing 20 liters of water on your head hands-free. But something special happened. In between our water walks and cleaning activities, we had conversations. We began speaking about international education policy in our very own way. We spoke about the woes of high school and the nuanced challenges of being a young woman and girl in education. We had created a community. I decided to return to Wulawayo to continue growing our community. And after a long day of navigating offices by foot, I came home, I sat on the couch, opened up my phone, and I had an email from Stanford University. It read, blah, 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 decision. I quickly opened up my application portal, opened up the PDF, scanned through, Congratulations! I got in. <laughs> and I had been awarded a fellowship for my potential to contribute to the field of education. Oh my goodness, everything was going perfectly. Our community, it was growing. I had finally gone into Stanford. And now I had to leave? No way. How could I leave? I accepted my offer to Stanford University. And I returned to Bambanga Manza with plans to move to California in the fall. Upon my return, we continued our work with the community. We built our own community, taking time aside from our daily duties. to implement. This was international education policy. But I had depleted my savings and I was running out of time. We continued and we worked. Then the world fell apart. COVID-19 infection rates skyrocketed. Physical restrictions meant that there was minimal to no travel at all. 
globally, but also in Wulawayo, leaving me in Cholocho. So I began my studies virtually at Stanford University from rural Zimbabwe. Mind you, starting my education from specifically Mbambanga Manza would mean that I would have to raise enough money to buy a solar powered charger that could allow me to charge my laptop. Not to mention the money to build a system that would allow me a strong enough network access to join my calls virtually. I had envisioned being at Stanford University in the heart of California in Palo Alto at the intersection of education and technology, not joining my classes from a shaky virtual call of, with network obtained from the urban center of Cholocho. So, with the 4.0 GPA and wonderful relationships with my professors, I dropped out. One point five semesters before graduation, I dropped out. And I dropped out quietly without telling my family. Questions float in my brain. Zola, what did you do? Zola, you're a Stanford dropout now? Zola, you're a quitter? No, I'm not, but Zola, you quit. I was broken. And with my face in my hands, I sat down on the front veranda and I cried from the inside out, wondering where my dreams could go and what would amount to my community. It was during this time that I turned to the arts. I'm a dancer and I dance for therapy. And there was an artist whose music resonated with my story, Kwabarati. We actually later collaborated on a dance project. He's an artist using specifically African indigenous knowledge systems to tell stories. It was through him that I also met a Sangoma, a traditional healer who is also preserving African indigenous knowledge systems. It was in living with them, in speaking with them, and in immersing myself in the principles of indigenous African knowledge systems that I understood that this shift in my journey was not the end. It was an understanding the cyclical nature of life through the lens of indigenous African knowledge systems that I regained hope. And it was only when I internalized that hope that I decided to allow myself to return to Canada. Upon my return, I had the immense privilege to restart my formal education at Western University. What, Zola? A master's of science? There's no way. A scientist, a health scientist at that, a whole researcher on a full national scholarship? Whoa. but I carried the dreams of my community with me. Sourcing over 500 pieces of science equipment for laboratories simply based on the work and conversations that happened in Bambanga Manza, Cholocho. So what is considered education? Informal 
and formal education, as well as indigenous ways of knowing, together play a vital role in building a better world for women and girls. So sure, I didn't get to complete my studies in international education policy, but I lived them. Thank you. Thank you.